Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today we're going to be covering warp field geometry, as I said in the uh, Stormbird video. Before we do, I'd just like to, well, shout out my members. Uh, we hang out on Discord. If you become a channel member, you can join us. And really, this video is largely spawned by a conversation I had with them, where we talked about warp field geometry, and they mentioned that while it's something that I've mentioned a lot, it's not actually something I've ever explained in depth. So I'm going to cover it here so everyone can see, everyone knows, and we have the a clearly delineated system set out, and that is my goal here. It is to create a, a system for explaining warp field geometry and why different ships have different warp geometries and why that's important. So let's get into it. I'm going to make a very quick disclaimer, okay? This is my head cannon. This is not really... It's backed up by some cannon evidence, but it is largely head cannon to build a whole system around what we see. Now, the other thing, I will not be covering in this video other factors that, di that affect warp speed or warp performance, like warp cores or nacelle length. You know, these, these are separate factors kind of deserving of their own video, and, you know, they vary you know, between, again, they similarly vary between different powers, different races, and different styles of ship. I'm not going to cover that, I am just going to cover where are the nacelles positioned relative to the mass of the ship. That's what we're doing here. That's all we're doing here. So, without any further ado, we'll get into it. So, essentially, we have to make a few assumptions when looking at warp field geometry. The first is that, okay, I know that some smart ass is going to comment and say, well, it doesn't matter where it is relative to the ship's hull because there's no such thing as up or down in space. Yes, but for the sake of this, and for this to make any level of sense, we're going to say that there is an up and down in subspace, in the subspace domain, and that affects how warp fields perform. We are also going to have to make the assumption that any kind of p thing I say about the, the the ship's performance or how it affects the ship's performance, it's worth remembering that this is going to be relativistic to the ship's mass. Um, so obviously, larger ships could potentially be faster, but they may be less agile, stuff like that. Here's another assumption, So, and this is, I think, fairly obvious, is that a tighter geometry field, a field that is proportionally smaller compared to say, another ship of a similar size, that is obviously more efficient now, but it's not the only trait up for grabs, and by having a more a tighter warp field, a more efficient warp field, you're likely to lose out on other traits, which we'll cover. Finally, just in terms of how I'm going to be explaining this, or what visual aids I'm going to use to explain this, we're going to be looking at ships from the side profile, because it gives us the most information yes top down works as well but i'm i'm more interested in the in the side profile that tells us much more i will mention the what you can see from top elevation but that's less significant so right let's let's get into it so let's cover the axes we have the x axis so that is just the linear axis that is from front to back effectively in terms of direction of travel and basically, we have on one end, maneuverability, and on the other hand, stability. Essentially, depending on where your ship sits in this field, will, di will dictate how it performs at warp speed. If your ship sits very far forward in the field, so your nacelles are further back, because we're centering, the key to doing this, basically find the center point of the nacelle, and then place that at the center of this, make sure the ship fits inside this shape and then you will have you will see where the ship is you will have the ship's warp field geometry so if the ship leans very far forward in the field this gives it greater maneuverability because it is essentially ahead of the pivot point of the warp field the warp field is being controlled from that center point and you're ahead of it so any adjustments that you make, any kind of turns or maneuvers, are going to be magnified by kind of your own length. So you're going to be leaning into a turn much harder 
than if you were at the other end, if you were at the stable end of the warp envelope. So there's not many ships that do this, but for example, freighters do this quite a lot. They sit further back, and that means that their turns are much slower. Because of course they're going to be much slower. They're freighters. They're hopefully just traveling in a straight line. And they shouldn't really need to turn. What they do need is field stability. Now, field stability kind of covers two main factors. One, you know, it's it, it's partially tied to sort of efficiency, just sort of the, the, the level of energy required to maintain it. But also, stability also ties inevitably to the ability to remain in warp against hostile factors, be that that you're being shot at or that you're going through some kind of spatial phenomena or experiencing some kind of, you know, subspace nonsense. If you sit further back in that pocket, in the envelope, you're going to have a more stable warp field and that's going to enable you to ride out a lot of things, um, including enemy weapons fire. It's also less demanding on the on the warp field. Right, now we have the y-axis, y to the sky. So from bottom to the top, so at the bottom of the y-axis, you have, you have cruising, cruise capability. So basically, the lower you sit in the pocket, the more easily your ship will cruise at higher speeds. That's essentially what that allows is if you sit very low in that, your ship will be able to um, cruise very nicely at quite high speeds. So that's why you see a lot of Federation ships with the nacelles arranged above the ship so that they can cruise at a good high speed. Now on the flip side, at the other end of the y-axis, is acceleration. And this is kind of basically the easier it is for your ship to accelerate in warp velocities. Yes, there are other factors like the size of your nacelles and the size of your warp coils and the size of your core. But the warp field geometry also does make a difference for that essentially for that acceleration to be produced the most quickly and if you sit at the top of the warp field the acceleration is much stronger and much more rapid essentially by sitting at the top of the above the warp pocket or at the top of the envelope you're able to accelerate much faster and this is something you see on a lot of klingon ships because they're more you know aggressively designed finally we get to the z axis that is and the z-axis is basically the distance between the nacelles because some nacelles are arranged very tight and some nacelles are arranged very wide. Um, again, it's partially a relative thing. If your nacelles are very wide compared to the ship's mass, say they extend on very wide pylons, you know, that's very different compared to even though the warp field of, let's say, the Romulan the Romulan star glider, even though that warp field is obviously much, much, much smaller than that of the Dedurodex, proportionally compared to the ship's mass, it's much wider of the because of the fact that the Dedurodex, which keeps it actually relative, the nacelles relatively close within about a square. You think about the shape of the Dedurodex is approximately a square in its length and width. Whereas the star glider here is basically a rectangle it's very wide and it does the warp field is very wide so that's essentially that's the dictating factor so effectively with the z-axis you basically go from your ability to generate a high top speed against efficiency so the closer your nacelles are together the more efficient they will be if your nacelles are very close together you will get much better they will be much more energy efficient. You will have less sort of energy loss. They won't be so demanding on your on your on your fuel supply, on your energy supply. But you will limit the amount of speed that can be generated by the interaction of the two nacelles because they're they're closer together. I, you could say that essentially the warp fields, the two fields generated by the nacelles, aren't effectively as large because they're instantly butting up against one another. If you think of the nacelles as both generating a a warp, a, a sort of half a warp field, a, you know, a positive field and a negative field, like on a magnet, the closer they are together, 
the 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 tighter the geometry, the less space those fields have to interact with the rest of space before the other one cancels them out. Whereas compared to some a ship that has its nacelles much a much wider angle compared to the hull, maybe even wider than the hull, they've got a lot more space to interact with spaced time uh, before they impact the other nacelle and are cancelled out. It's a bit like a Venn diagram, overlaps around the ship, that's essentially the warp pocket, and then what we've been looking at from the uh, side has been that pocket, that's the pocket that it's sitting in. And yeah, so basically that's what dictates the difference between top speed and engine efficiency. Obviously, if your engines are basically operating at a lower energy level, they're going to be more efficient, but you are limiting yourself out of top speed. Now, a couple more caveats. I promise these are the last ones. The shape of warp fields are custom to each ship. In the diagrams that I've been using, I've been using effectively the same shape of field, just as a kind of stand-in general thing, but reality is that the fields are going to be obviously custom to each ship, then it's not going to have that geometry it's going to be slightly different and that will partially affect the ship's relative position within its own warp field but it will still generally be in the in the approximate right same place roughly additionally quad nacelles and tri nacelles have other effects generally quad nacelles have the effect of producing a more stable warp field that can hold higher speeds for longer and trying cells produce a sort of a level of instability. They generally improve uh, the maneuvering because you have a kind of unstabilizing element. Most dual nacelle ships basically operate on tank steering principles. Increase power to one nacelle, decrease power to the other, turn the ship. It's not quite, whereas a tri nacelle ship has this kind of unstable gyroscopic effect going on as well. Finally, you have dual mode nacelle ships. Now, these are ships that have four nacelles, for example, uh, one of the Nebula prototypes or the uh, Romulan Firehawk. And they have four nacelles, but they're not lined up. So they can't produce warp fields between all four of them. What you essentially have is two separate sets of warp engines that will produce separate results or separate warp geometries. That's the key thing. So you can basically choose between two different modes of warp travel, uh, which can be very handy. Obviously, it's very cost-intensive. Another alternative to that is just using variable geometry, which, you know, the Intrepid uses or Klingon and, some, Klingon and Romulan Buds of Prey like to use. So, you know, it's not the only way of doing that, but it is one of the ways you do that, is with basically two different sets of nacelles for different kinds of flight. Okay, that's the end of the caveats. So now I'll just go on to some examples. Um, so we have the Constitution. As you can see, it sits very low and very forward in the warp pocket. So what that is going to do is it's going to have good maneuverability, pretty good maneuverability at warp speed, and it's going to have a good, it's going to have a good cruise. It's also proportionally, because we look at looking at say the width, which are just about the equal with the actual width of the hull or a little less so you're looking at pretty you know that's a pretty typical balance between energy efficiency and uh top speed so there are going to be ships that are going to be able to maybe generate proportionally more top speed but they're almost certainly going to be less fuel efficient and that's why they go with that kind of design and most ships go with around about that kind of uh, design. The D7, kind of the other end of the coin, so it sits high, it's going to get a lot better acceleration, and it's going to be just as maneuverable, if not more maneuverable, because of how the proportions work out for the nacelle centerline. Here's the Romulan Star Glider. This is an example of a ship that is going to max out on speed, at high speed cruise. It's going to have very little maneuverability, and it's going to be relatively slow to accelerate. But for its size and for the power that it's being that is generated on board, it's going to have an incredible high-speed cruise. Now the problem is, is that the ship itself is pathetic. It's a, it's, it's a technological test bed, nothing more. But it's a demonstration of what can be done. 
as I previously mentioned, with Cardassian ships and cargo ships, they're actually quite unique. They sit further back in the warp field. They rely a lot more on the stability factors. Now, you know, just because you sit further back in the warp field does not mean that you can't also get acceleration and or a high cruise. But that's a little rarer. I can't think of any, any examples off the top of my head. That's not to say that they aren't out there. And, you know, I'd welcome people to suggest ships. And again, use this um, template yourself and, um, you know, apply it to different ships and see if you can find any interesting geometries. So essentially, really, what we get here is a very surprising variation. Yeah, most races pref most races prefer one kind of geometry, but even then, there's generally some variations for specialist ships designed for specific roles, and there are exceptions. Uh, you know, the Klingons like their acceleration maneuverability, the Federation like their high-speed crews. Generally, the Romulans actually like a... I, I know I showed the Star Glider, but that's quite exceptional. Most of the time, the Romulans go for a fairly balanced uh, geometry. They sit pretty much at the center of the warp field with a very low profile. They want to minimize that warp disruption wave because that's something that's quite detectable. And for people who are very interested in stealth... That's not so good to them. That's why the Dediridex basically fits perfectly inside its own warp bubble. There's basically no wasted room. It's very, very efficient. And then finally, the Cardassians really favor stability and balance in their warp field. While the Klingons and the Federation have kind of had this constant technological battle about warp speed performance and the ability to fight and engage at warp speed combat, the Cardassians, I think, very much view warp as... This is a way for getting from A to B, and that is it. They're not interested in how they perform in, in that uh, realm of warp speed combat. There is some variation, but it's very mild. It's very minimal variation for the Cardassians. Yeah, so just to conclude, so the axis are... You've got your x-axis. Maneuverability, stability. Your y-axis, cruising acceleration your z axis or z axis people had a go at me for calling the nova the z1 nova rather than the z1 nova z axis if it's wide that means high speed capability high energy if it's tight high efficiency got all that right so basically yeah take take a screenshot of these um of this template and go apply it to any kind of starship you come across essentially and uh, see what you get and let me know what you get i'd be very interested if you can turn up any interesting or unique geometries or orientations and then potentially you know depending on your findings go create some new ships based on you know what you've discovered and what you would like to see used more perhaps uh and also if you've got alternative suggestions for a system i'm i'm open to hearing them I'm interested to see what people have in mind. But also, if you're going to be very snarky and smart ass in the comments, bugger off. I, I, I get so sick of people saying that it's oh, space isn't 2D. Don't you know that? Yeah, I know that. But we don't yet live in an age of holodecks. So stop bringing it up. You couldn't even begin to fathom it if I did it. So that's enough of that. Uh, thank you guys for watching. And I will see you guys in the next video.